Hello and welcome to everyone to another Unchained Labs live demo. My name is Rifar Jangil. I'm going to be your moderator for today. I am the Director of Field Application Sciences at Unchained Labs. So today's event is titled CO Capsids Leak and Top AV Genome Ejection and Capsid Stability on Onco. And so the goal for today is to give you both an insight into what we do during Uncle AV demos, but also just how easy AV characterization on Uncle is, but also an appreciation for the Uncle software, how to set up a run, and how to go through the analysis. Your acting FAS today is going to be Kevin Lenz. <laughs> and I'm saying acting because he's in fact our marketing manager for all analytical products. And just between you and me, if a marketing person can run the Uncle, I'd say anyone can use it. <laughs> But no, I'm just kidding. So Kevin is actually a, an excellent communicator, but he's also a highly skilled trained scientist. And so he's going to walk us through the Uncle AV demo today. And I'm going to pass it on to Kevin. Kevin, without further ado. Kevin, the show is yours. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Rafar, for that very uh, warm and honest introduction, we'll say. Uh, so like Rafar I mentioned, today we're going to be talking about the Uncle, which is kind of the all-in-one multimodal biologic stability plan. So what makes the uncle special is that it actually combines three different detection modes. And today we're gonna to be looking at how to uh, look at fluorescence, SLS, and DLS, those two detection modes, all on AAV samples. So what uncle uh, kind of was used for initially was you know, looking at protein stability. So antibodies falling apart as you heat them up. But uh, thankfully uncle has full spectrum fluorescence capabilities. So it can always do that sort of intrinsic fluorescence look at antibodies but today we're gonna to use that real full spectrum look and uh, take a look at cyber gold dye uh, to watch DNA escaping from AV capsids as you heat them up. So that's great. It's a great look at the flexibility of the uncle and really gives us an appreciation for all the different kinds of applications it can be used for. So that's fluorescence. Static light scattering, I like to explain that by saying it's like shining a flashlight on a foggy day. It's gonna give us a really quick picture of how aggregation is um, progressing in the sample as it heats up. So we'll also use that to take a picture of how AAV is aggregating after unfolding in the uncle as it heats up. So with one little experiment, we'll get a look at both how CyberGold is showing us uh, what DNA is being released from our capsids and when capsids start to aggregate because they're unfolded. That's gonna be important because as we'll see, the DNA release of the AAV capsids happens anywhere from 15, 20, 25 degrees Celsius before capsids unfold and aggregate. The last technology inside of Uncle that we'll look at today is the dynamic light scattering, or DLS, and we'll use that to get an understanding of the size and size distribution of our samples, uh, both before and after thermal ramp, and that'll tell us that we're looking at a, a homogeneous, monodispersed, uh, non-aggregated AAV sample during our experiment. Okay, so, like I said, today we're going to be using CyberGold dye to look at DNA release. And so the basic principle of that is we're going to use UNCLE's 473 nanometer blue laser to excite fluorescence in CyberGold. And then as CyberGold gets exposed to more and more DNA in solution, as it leaks out from capsids, then the fluorescence of CyberGold will increase. Uh, so that brings us to the uni, which is UNCLE's consumable. Uh, so we'll take a very close look at this in just a moment. But what we're gonna be looking at today is some samples run on the uni where we have a dilution series of AAV9. Uh, so we'll take a look at how concentration can impact you know, capsid stability as in regards to DNA uh, leakage. Uh, we'll also take a look at some DNA controls and some empty capsid controls to really you know, narrow down that what we're looking at is indeed DNA escaping capsids. And we'll also take a look at some samples that have a fixed capsid titer but have uh, a, a sort of a dilution series of empty full ratio, if you will. So 100% full, 75% full, 50% full, et cetera. All right, so let's go take a closer look at the uni and understand what makes it so special. Okay, so here we have a setup with uh, the uni, which I'll kind of hold it just right, and you should be able to see the reflection of the light on 16 quartz cubets in the uni. So each one of these uh, quartz cubets helps us run a little tiny DSF experiment inside of the uncle. The idea is that the quartz is gonna be UV transparent, so we could use it for protein intrinsic fluorescence, and it's also gonna be a robust temperature, so, uh, as well as inert to your sample. So that's why all, you know, the only materials you'll see, the sample will see, are gonna be quartz and silicone. All right, so 
the other thing that I want to emphasize with the unit is the aluminum frame, which is great for heat transfer. Now, I'm going to show you how to load this unit, how to get it ready for an experiment. And you'll notice we're in the Unchained Lab studio, and I'm not wearing any um, uh, lab coats or gloves. So it'll actually just be loading with water. So don't worry about it. But we'll have some AAV ready to uh, analyze on the envelope in a moment. All right. So the first thing about the unit that you might have just noticed is that it's actually magnetized. So on the loading tool, I can just drop it in and it snaps right in place. We're not going to have any issues with the uni being misaligned or falling out after getting ready to load. So next, I'm going to take my classic P25 putter at 8.8 .8 microliters, and I'm going to aspirate up a little sample of that water that I mentioned. OK. And now this, the process is easy. I simply uh, insert the pipette tip into the uni, eject my 8.8 .8 microliters, and that's it. I got one sample ready to go. So I'll show that one more time just so everyone gets an idea of how simple that is. Boom. OK. And in this case, uh, because the sample volume is so small, it actually is held in place by the, kind of the capillary forces involved in that uh, tiny capillary. OK. So now I have samples loaded in my uni. And the next step is to seal them in the blue uni frame. This is also pretty easy. All we do is a pretty quick swoop and lock. All right. So now I have my uni with my samples in it and silicone gaskets on either side sealing in my samples. So I don't have to worry about leakage or evaporation. And then the uni is still going to be in contact with the heating surface uh, once I load it into the uncle. So let's take this uni back to the uncle and uh, see how you know, the rest of the experiment is operated. OK, so now I'm going to set up an experiment just to show you how easy and quick it is. Uh, and then we'll you know, take a look at the analysis software of the previously ran experiment using, again, uncle analysis. So let's take this back to the uncle and take a look at the software. All right, so hopefully we're uh, checking each other out via webcam right here on the uncle computer. And what I'm going to do to set up my capsule stability experiment is first just go to Capsids, because I've already logged into the software. And you'll first see uh, all the different applications that uh, are available on the uncle. And this is a result of the three different detection methods and all the different ways that we can combine them with the heating element on the uncle. You've got TMTAG with optional DLS. That is the, the typical experiment you might run if you're interested in just looking at the intrinsic fluorescence of a protein or AAV capsid. But today, we're going to be setting up a viral toolbox run. We'll go here and select capsid stability in DLS, and pick our project for the live demo. All right, so in this run, first thing we do is assign our sample set. In this case, I've preloaded an AAV live demo, live demo sample set uh, with all the samples that will correlate to what we're going to look at for uh, uncle analysis. Uh, in this case, you'll see that we have a dilution series, some DNA controls, uh, empty controls, and then a mixture of samples. So, I can go ahead and add all those samples to my uni if I want, because I've actually set this up in Excel in duplicate, so it's very easy to assign it all in duplicate. Or if I wanted to, I could uh, simply select one sample and add it in duplicate or do the same with the whole list. So since I've already put together the sample set in Excel, I can add all, and there are all my samples ready to go. Next comes the experimental design for the uncle. So the way a capsid stability experiment is going to work is First, at the starting temperature for this experiment, in this case 25 degrees Celsius, we're going to take an initial fluorescence read of the sample, followed by DLS, which we can select to, to skip or not, depending on what we want to do with this, uh, this experiment. And then we'll run a thermal ramp, uh, in this case, between that 25 degrees Celsius starting point and 95 degrees uh, Celsius to make sure that everything is uh, unfolded and kind of ruptured and leaking all the fluorescence into the solution. Following that thermal wrap, we'll take another end temperature DLS read and, then, and return to 25 degrees Celsius, where we'll do a final initial fluorescence read. So in one experiment, we get more than five data points uh, looking at how the capsid was behaving before I ran a thermal wrap, results during a thermal wrap, results after that thermal wrap. So we'll go ahead and leave this as the default and just hit apply. Okay. And now we are ready to switch back and take a look at how we're going to load the uni samples into the uncle. So 
as the uncle opens up, you'll see the uh, copper heating element at the bottom. And we're going to simply take the uni that we loaded earlier and place it onto that surface. So I'll lift up the cover plate. And again, through that magnetized uh, features of the uni, it's a simple drop and then the uni snaps into place. We're placing the cover plate and we're ready to get started with the uncle experiment. So let's switch back and uh, we're going to look at the uncle computer to hit run and we're going to take a peek at some results from what I ran earlier. Okay, so loading samples and I'm closing the door. So that's it. At this point, um, all that's left is for me to hit a quick start button and the uncle will take it from there and run the experiment that we designed on this sample set. I will let the door close for just one more moment, and then we're going to shift over to uncle analysis, and take a look at what these results will look like. So here's a quick look at uh, that capsule stability result. Oh, I can hear the uncle's finished uh, putting the plate into position. So quick start, and I'm ready to go. So switching back to uncle analysis, uh, I have here kind of some pre-baked results from an AAV sample that I ran earlier. In this case, we start with the dilution series of AAV5. Now, what we can see is uh, starting just with the highest concentration sample, we'll start with some kind of initial fluorescence intensity that's based on how much free DNA is in my sample. And then from there on, my temperature ramp will heat my sample up, and you can see increases in uh, cybergold fluorescence that will correspond to uh, ejection events of DNA from the capsids. If I want to investigate aggregation at the same time, I could simply overlay the SLS signal and get an idea of uh, when my capsid aggregation starts to occur. In this case, I don't see much behavior happening until about, we'll say, 85, you know, 88 degrees Celsius, uh, where I can actually check this box and see where Uncle has identified a TAG, which is the onset of that aggregation behavior. Adding in the TM tells us where inflection points in this curve are, and with this one result, I can get a very nice picture of uh, the inflection points as DNA was released from capsids, which are gonna be the solid bars here. Those are the TMs. And then the aggregation temperature that happens when the capsid is unfolded. We can actually pair that with knowledge from a TM and TAG experiment, uh, understanding that yes, this capsid uh, did have protein uh, sort of integrity loss at about 86, 87 degrees Celsius, and that's where aggregation occurs. But in this case, we're seeing something different. We're seeing DNA ejection, and aggregation. So I'll simplify things and take a look at all of the results. And here again is that dilution series. So if we want to investigate melting temperature across different dilution series from 1E12 VG per mil uh, down to uh, 2.5E12 VG per mil, and then a control sample, we can see that those melting temperatures are pretty consistent. And indeed, if we analyze this, we generally don't see a trend uh, with regards to concentration. If we add on the SLS data, we'll also see that aggregation increases at the same uh, point in time and temperature. Okay, so if we want to compare these results to simple DNA, we can click on this button and see that, hey, here we have that initial fluorescence uh, of cyber gold, and then it just decreases a little bit as we increase the temperature of our sample, which is expected. And then we can take a look at empty AAV capsids as well, and compare those to the signal that you get from a full capsid and understand the order of magnitude difference when we have DNA present in the sample versus when we don't have DNA present in the sample. All right, and then lastly is the kind of mixtures of 100% full all the way down to 0% full, keeping capsid concentration constant. So in this case, we will select all of these samples again, and we notice a remarkably similar pattern to the dilution series that we saw earlier, uh, which when you think about it, it kind of makes sense. If we're keeping capsid concentration constant and we're going through and we're decreasing the amount of DNA in each one of these samples, where this is the highest percent full and then we're going to the lowest percent full here at the bottom, then really we're just looking at the behavior of constant, amount, of constant amounts of DNA. If we overlay that with our other samples, we can click to highlight all of these, you'll start to see that exactly what I described is true. So where we have completely empty capsids, that aligns very well with where we had buffer controls in our previous experiment, and where we have a 50% full capsid, that aligns with a result where we had the same number of genomes, genomes in a previous experiment. 
Okay, so that's fluorescence and SLS data uh, being used for AAV capsule stability. Now let's take a look at DLS and get an understanding of how that can be used. So once again, uh, we can take a look at our dilution series of capsids, get an understanding of most of these capsids are around the order of about 30 nanometers in diameter, but we do have see, see some aggregation in this sample. And that's just up to us and our process to understand how much that aggregation is going to impact these results. In this case, we know that these results are going to produce uh, pretty good, trustworthy uh, data. Okay, so that's a look at AAV data on Uncle using the viral toolbox. So let's switch back and go into Q&A. All right, Rafar, so I bet some questions have come in. What do you got for me? Excellent. Yes. Yeah, so first of all, great job. I think this is really impressive. In fact, this is actually so good that I received a message from a salesperson telling me that they would like to do it next because you made it look really easy to really uncle is truly accessible to everyone at this point. <laughs> so just to recap, I just want to say, so I took some notes and just to make sure I get what you're saying. So with uncle, you can independently assess capsid stability and genome ejection, right? So you have intrinsic fluorescence and dye-based fluorescence. I think you mentioned Sabagold. Um, you also showed through the overlay that you are doing there that you can simultaneously assess or compare different samples or different conditions, which I thought was quite informative. And finally, you went into DLS to measure size of your samples, and you also highlighted the fact that you can detect aggregation if you have that present in your sample. Does that sound about right? Yeah, that sounds right. It's a pretty nice, concise summary. Okay, <laughs> sounds good. So let's go to the Q&A. Let's see what has come in so far. So question number one should be an easy one. How long does an experiment take? Uh, so that's a little bit up to you and a little bit up to the science. So for an uncle, typical experiment will be around three hours, but you can make that longer or shorter depending on if you want to require DLS data or not, or what uh, ramp rate you want to use for your experiment. But like I said, three hours is a pretty good rule of thumb. Excellent. Okay, and then just to remind everyone, there's a Q&A button uh, at the bottom of your screen, so simply click on it and feel free to submit additional questions. Question number two, what concentration of AV do I need to use on Uncle? Ah, so good question. For what we looked at today, which is using Cybergold dye as sort of a fluorescence marker of DNA release, uh, our lower limit is going to be about 5 times 10 to the 11 pg per mil. And that's just purely based on how much DNA you need uh, to get an appreciable fluorescence signal with Cybergold. Okay, excellent. Let's see, question number three, can you see differences in serotypes uh, with these type of behaviors? Ah, yes, absolutely. And that's been one of the most exciting findings as we kind of rolled this out to the world. Uh, each serotype has its own unique, we'll call it pattern of DNA release and melting temperature. So it's, it's very much uh, unique to the capsid structure. Um, and you'll see dramatic steps in DNA release or you'll see smooth uh, increases in DNA, DNA release depending on the serotype you're looking at. Okay. And if you want to co-mix some serotypes, could you distinguish them? Uh, yeah, so we have looked at that. Um, you can actually distinguish them in multiple ways. Uh, the intrinsic fluorescence, the DNA release by Cybergold, uh, and the aggregation will all behave a little bit differently than when you have a kind of homogenous sample by itself. Uh, actually, one of the, the really interesting and counterintuitive uh, results that we saw on that is if you mix two serotypes with different uh, protein melting temperatures, you'll actually get two aggregation onset temperatures, which is really neat. Excellent. That's actually pretty cool. Awesome. Let's see. Question number three. I see that you have the initial fluorescence um, temperatures, and you also have the initial fluorescence at the final temperature. Can this be used for anything else? Can we learn anything from it? Yeah, definitely. So because we're starting the experiment with Cybergold dye free in the environment, that's going to give us a picture of how much free DNA is floating around in there. Uh, and it'll be a fluorescence intensity, but it'll be a helpful understanding of uh, what we have uh, kind of exposed to Cybergold dye with that free DNA. And then the final DNA uh, measurement is going to be an understanding of how much DNA was added to the solution over the experiment, which is going to be you know, proportional to how many viral genomes you had uh, present in the sample. So those will give a nice picture at sort of the before and after thermal stability experiment in terms of DNA concentration. Excellent. Let's see. The next question is, how would you go about using Uncle to look at both stability and genome injection at the same time? Is that possible? 
So to look at stability and genome injection at the same time. So what I would like, so what I typically do when I'm, I'm designing experiments is I will uh, start with the TMTAG DLS mm -hmm. experiment. And that's gonna be a very nice picture of what the behavior of the actual protein capsid itself will do. So by intrinsic fluorescence, we're exciting this protein with a UV laser and we're getting the fluorescence of the actual protein. We'll understand when things unfold and we'll also get SLS data to see when things aggregate. Now from there, I'll just start doing capsid stability experiments because I do get that SLS aggregation information uh, at, during my capsid stability experiments. Now the important thing there is with a capsid stability experiment, we're gonna get DNA ejection and aggregation behavior, but I've already tied that aggregation behavior to knowing when my capsid proteins unfold. So at that point, I'm able, able to bridge between DNA ejection and uh, protein unfolding based on that aggregation information. Excellent. Okay. Next question is, is the analysis of multiple samples sequential or simultaneous? And will one sample be seen at one temperature for longer than others? So the way that we uh, analyze our samples in the uncle is you can run from one up to 48. And so as the thermal ramp progresses, uh, we'll, be we'll be sort of reading each sample uh, sequentially and then uh, just running each one, you know, kind of reading each one as fast as we go. Uh, so this is a pretty nice picture and allows us to get a really nice relative measurement. Um, however, if say for example, for uh, protein integrity, for protein stability, you wanted to look at a step thermal ramp where each protein is at the same temperature, but say for different times, uh, you've made a, a trade off in terms of uh, slightly different temperatures versus slightly different times of that temperature. Um, typically we'll see customers go with a linear ramp uh, that results in slightly different temperatures for each sample, which is something we track when we make those measurements. Excellent. So you actually record the actual temperature while reading that sample. So it's not a model temperature or anything of that sort. Yeah, absolutely. And if you look at the data on uncle analysis, you'll actually be able to see that each uh, point is slightly offset from the previous read. So we take into account all those factors. Excellent, thank you. Perfect, so next question goes, I may, have, I may have missed this, but what volume should be injected in the cuvette? What is your minimum volume? So the volume for the, uh, the unique uh, cuvette is 8.8 .8 microliters. Although like Rafar said, I'm a marketing person, so I tend to round up to nine microliters, but 8.8 .8 is the precise uh, volume to use. Sounds good, we'll not hold you against you. Um, so <laughs> next question is, how does simple purity impact your results? Uh, what simple purity threshold is recommended? Uh, so, oh, good question. And one that actually um, does tie to an earlier question about mixing stereotypes. Uh, so what we usually recommend is that you, you do need a relatively pure sample. Um, you know, you're gonna want results on the proteins that you're studying and not on cellular proteins floating around. So our rule of thumb is something like 90% uh, of your sample is AAV proteins. Uh, and that'll give you a pretty good look at your result. And then indeed, um, performance will improve as purity increases. Okay. So typically we'll see people, customers using this uh, after some kind of uh, SEC or occasionally cation exchange chromatography or AUC purification steps. Excellent, thank you. Okay, next question would be, what would happen, and I think you touched on that before, but what would happen if there is a mix of serotypes? Uh, can you define what signal is related to what serotype? Is that possible? So could you repeat uh, the last part of that question? Can you define? Sure. Can you define what signal is related to which serotype? So if you have a mixture of serotypes, can you distinguish that transition number one is from serotype A versus serotype two or AV2 versus AV6, so on and so forth? Uh, yeah, so good question. That depends a little bit on what serotypes you're measuring. So different serotypes uh, can have behaviors that coincide uh, when they're mixed, say, for example, um, or they can be dramatically different. So say, for example, AAV5 uh, will typically have a protein unfolding aggregation temperature, like we saw, uh, 85 degrees or higher. Uh, depends a little bit on the buffer that it's in. Uh, meanwhile, AAV9 will have an aggregation temperature that's more around 74 or 75 degrees Celsius. So because those two serotypes have a pretty good difference between the two behaviors, then we're able to see two different distinct behaviors, both with intrinsic fluorescence for melting uh, and with aggregation behavior by SLS. And then indeed the uh, cyber gold ejection behavior will be dramatically different than what you'd expect for either uh, pure serotype on its own. Excellent. 
So would you have to essentially characterize each serotype individually, and in cases where you have a mixture of them, you'll be able to confidently assign which CM goes to which? Yeah, that's definitely how I would set up that experiment. First, okay. start with known pure samples, understand what those look like, and then you can understand what the mix looks like uh, afterwards. Makes sense. OK, thank you. All right, our next question goes, can you run samples during the process, harvest them through the purification steps to look at full versus empty? So for that question, um, that also goes back to another question about how long experiment takes. Mm -hmm. So it'll take about three hours to get an answer. Uh, so it depends on what kind of uh, step in the process you're looking at. And then concentration is also the other factor to consider. Uh, so in the case of the cybergold ejection, I mentioned about five times 10 to the 11th BG per mil is what you need to get a really uh, robust quantitative and precise result for genome ejection on AAV. So if the step in the process you're considering checks those boxes, then yeah, absolutely. It makes sense that you could run this as an in-process test. Uh, the other way that this has been looked at by process development groups is to run a, you know, sort of an experiment evaluating different variables per step in the process and then continue out through the rest of your purification and use UMPL to evaluate it uh, further downstream than that upstream test. So say, for example, freeze thaw for harvest. Mm -hmm. If you want to look at the number of freeze thaw cycles versus stability, that's something you could easily do once you run the rest of your purification process. Excellent, excellent. Let's see. So our next question says, do you see differences between lots of various preparations of one serotype? So if you had AV2 and you prepared a lot on day one versus two months later, what, do you see differences between lots, like lots of variability and can you characterize those? So uh, yes, we do see differences. And actually, kind of the, the first difference that we'll typically see is by checking it over on DLS and seeing how much aggregation might have occurred uh, from lot to lot, whether that's by uh, looking at storage over time or just by variations in your process. So first thing to always check is to look for sample aggregation on DLS to make sure that you're still working with a nice happy virus sample. Um, and then after that, uh, differences in percent full differences in uh, capsid concentration will be available to you as you look at the different results on UNCLE. Um, so it's, it's more about, um, let's say I understand my capsid concentration by ELISA, uh, but I see very, very different behaviors uh, in my sample in terms of amplitude uh, by UNCLE, then that's going to be another clue that, hey, these two samples have a uh, different behavior of, of DNA release. Excellent. Thank you. So really, this is useful over time as well, right? So if I had a sample that, again, I prepared on day zero and I had some nominal amount of DNA detected, over time, I could actually see that, to your point, if, if I have DNA leakage, right, that at different time points, I could see an increase in the amount of DNA present in my buffer, and therefore, presumably, the caps is actually a bit more leaky uh, over time. Is, is that correct? Uh, yeah, that's correct. Yes, that's a, that's a pretty nice summary. Thank you. Okay. No, of course, no problem. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, next question comes from an anonymous person who goes, what biological relevance does early or later stage damage like DNA leakage have, um, and why measure the characteristic? Like, why does it matter? Why, why do you measure DNA leakage, and why is it biologically relevant? So it's biologically relevant um, kind of in a, in, a, in a couple different places. Uh, the first place is maybe what I would perhaps call clinically relevant, where we're going to understand how robust this AAV is uh, to leakage, damage, or aggregation over time when it's stored in that final vial uh, preparation. Uh, the actual cellular biology, biological reference of it, too, can come if you think of this as uh, another way of looking at capsid uncoating. So it's the kind of process that you don't want to happen uh, at 37 degrees Celsius You know, if the sample is maybe on a heated column for chromatography, or maybe it's uh, immediately upon injection. You don't want that. Uh, DNA ejection to occur, but you do want to understand how different serotypes are going to behave once they enter into your cell and begin the uncoding process. Okay, very well. Excellent. Um, well, there's an easy question. Do you have, a de do you have demo units available for testing? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, absolutely. So we are currently doing uh, demos a few different ways uh, these days. Uh, there is options for on-site demos if that's, you know, you want to get your hands on the machine and take a look at them. Um, and then we're also doing demos a lot like this, too. So this is a public live demo, uh, but we're, we've been doing very commonly these days where you send us an AAV sample, 
uh, we'll run that in our lab and record that and you watch as we set up the experiment and uh, get the results off the uncle uh, live. So both remote and in-person demos are available. Excellent. Okay, so let's say we have time for one more question and it goes, does the size of the vector genome has an impact on the stability of the AV particle? Uh, yes, yes it will. So there is uh, some biophysical literature out there looking both at size of the genome and um, sort of structure of the genome as well. So single-stranded or self-complementary uh, DNA. And so that's, that's something that you know, is available out there in the literature to go, go investigate and understand the relationship between those factors. Excellent, yes, and it, that is correct, right? There is some evidence that the actual yeah. size of your vector can impact stability because certain viruses or stereotypes are able to only encapsulate certain size of, um, of genome. That's good. So that's right. a lot of questions. Right. And the very, easy, the very easy phenomenon to describe there is if you have a, uh, an overstuffed AAV, a larger than you know, typical genome, then, then that's going to be a less stable capsid. That result is yeah, pretty well documented. That's a beautiful analogy, yes. Like an overstuffed capsid. I like that. <laughs> that's exactly correct, yes. Uh, so thank you, Kevin. That was fantastic. Uh, and thanks to everyone for attending today. As a reminder, if you have any questions, we encourage you to send them to us either to info at unchainlab.com or contact any of your local reps and we're happy to answer them. We also encourage you to go to our website at unchainlabs.com. We'll answer any questions that you might have there. Um, and so once again, thanks for joining us and have a wonderful, wonderful day. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you much. Thanks everyone.